Good evening to everyone. As uh, I think most of you have been introduced to all that uh, is done during the development of a satellite. So today we'll try to see what we do to ensure that the systems which we have designed on the ground will work in space. I think uh, the esteemed lecturers before this have already covered in detail about satellites, the way they are built, what are the different parts that satellites contain, and uh, the applications of the satellite. Today we'll move to this uh, testing phase, how a satellite has to be tested so that it works reliably throughout its, its life, whatever it is, 7, 10. In some cases, it, these satellites even work for 25, 30 years. So how do you ensure the performance of a satellite for such a long duration? One of the ways we have to continuously do testing, even right from when we select a particular component, at that time also we are testing the component it, itself. If you put that component into a car, you have to test that car. If that car goes into a subsystem, you test the subsystem. Whenever there are any issues, you have to redesign. So this is a continuous loop. You have to design, test, have it reviewed by both your peers, your superiors. There will be an entire committee reviewing the thing. And whatever is the outcome of the review, you go back to the drawing board and you do the design again. One of the reasons why I have shown this as a continuous loop is, we never reach a stage where we can say that the design is 100% completely reliable. We always feel that if we had more time, if we can do one more iteration, then we can come up with a better design. And so this process continues until you, frankly, you run out of time. You have to meet the schedule. You have to launch the satellite. And so at, at a particular level of confidence in your design, you simply say, now it is time to fly this design. And uh, that is the way you have to do. The more you do the testing, you will ensure that there are less failures in space. So you keep on testing, keep on reviewing, redesigning until you are completely satisfied. Not only you, but there are special people who are reviewing your design, you are testing it out. So you have to satisfy those team members also that your design will work reliably in space. It's a very big challenge to build any space hardware. And uh, that is why every time something works, it feels so good. It's always as if uh, every success in space is a miracle. So many things can go wrong when you are designing a satellite. That is why you see when this James Webb Space Telescope was recently launched, it is said that there were 300 and approximately 350, 344 single point failures. What a single point failure means is if that particular point fails, then you have to compromise on the entire mission itself. And imagine something like 350 things, any one of these 350 goes wrong, and then your mission is not successful. Such is the challenge that is there when you are building a space hardware. If you look at even a single launch video, you will understand what all are the challenges that we go into. There are severe mechanical stress. The mechanical stress arises during the launch itself because when the satellite is being launched, the launch vehicle is going to vibrate. So that is one thing. Second, as it moves out upwards, there is a huge downward force acting on the equipment and all. This is what we call as the G-force. And uh, the satellites are tested up to many times the G of Earth. So that to, so as to ensure that survival. This is two, two most common tests. Even when we are doing man-rated vehicles and the crew module, they are tested right up to some 20 times the acceleration of our Earth's gravity to ensure that whatever the stress that is developed, it survives. Once it starts moving into the air, there is a lot of changes are happening. Dynamically, the air pressure is going to change. You are moving from an air environment to vacuum. You are going to face radiation. There are extreme temperatures that will be there. One side, the side which is facing the sun can become extremely hot. The other side becomes extremely cold. This can keep on changing also. And so this is one of the biggest hurdle when you are developing a space hardware. Apart from the mechanical, the temperatures also have to be properly maintained inside the satellite. 
and one of the criteria whenever you are doing a space system is you do not have any luxury of increasing the mass or the volume or the power as much as you want so a space system is supposed to do more with less that is it has to function as much as possible with as less mass as less volume and as less power as possible and it are, these are the things that makes a building a spacecraft an extremely challenging environment let's look at the launch video this is one of the videos that you are getting the volume So when a satellite is launched, you see these all are the checks that have to be performed. So right, what we sometimes hear is only the nine, eight, seven, six. But before that, there are thousands of events that have to be properly coordinated, and each member of the team has to give a go ahead before the launch takes place. And this is one of the way they are, they are giving each member, each manager who is managing his own subsystem, he is giving a go ahead. Usually, this is very common with NASA launches that there is a huge crowd watching the launch. This is now true even for ISRO missions where we have kept a huge gallery for visitors to see the launch. Look at the vibrations that the astronauts are facing. Even when the ignition takes place, even before liftoff, the engine is vibrating so much. It's, it's a huge amount of vibration is there, the acoustic noise. This is said that if you are standing next to a jet airliner, which is about to take off, Whatever noise you will hear, such a huge acoustic is heard when a shuttle lifts up. Then, of course, there are vibrations. There will be severe amount of vibrations are there. As long as the spacecraft is moving in the atmosphere, the air drag is causing this vibration, and then the liftoff will happen. Once the liftoff is there, as long as one stage is working, there may be uh, the pressure will remain something like same. But the moment any you have to cut off, for example, one stage cut off to second stage happens, there is a forward jerk, there is a shock, huge amount of shock is there. And the shock is also there when the next stage lights up. You can see how the astronauts will be forced backwards, see how they hit the back of their chair because the ignition started. So this shock is also there, severe shocks are there during the separation of the stages. And once you are out, this entire ultraviolet radiation, the cosmic rays, everything is going to hit your vehicles directly. That is one of the tests we have to perform. All these things, whatever the satellite is going to experience throughout its lifetime, this has to be tested completely on the ground. And of course, once you are into the space and you have sufficient velocity, you come into what is called as the microgravity environment. So you have to test for all these things. So if you looked at the video carefully you have this large dynamic forces dynamic because the forces are changing every instant to instant the forces will be changing because of the changing external environment in which the launch is taking place the atmosphere is going to slowly thin out so that that leads to a dynamic force acoustic the launch vehicle itself engine produces acoustic the separations are pro providing the acoustic and this leads to huge amount of vibrations Oh, it's a broad range. There are some very low frequency vibration, some high frequency vibration. Shock also you saw because of the ignition and stage separation. Oscillations again, they're similar what we are talking about vibrations and of course the microgravity. Once all this is experienced by the satellite and it is into the orbit, in the orbit we have an entirely different atmosphere from Earth. The temperature of course, as you all know, it's going to vary whichever the side is facing the sun you have extreme, it, it will keep on adding that temperature and the temperature will go on increasing. Whereas the opposite side, which is exposed to deep space, there is nothing there. So the temperature, whatever the structure is facing that side, it will continuously radiate and it can reach extreme minus temperature. Of course, space is hard vacuum. The vacuum is something like 1 million billion times. It is 1 million into 1 billion times, whatever the pressure on earth is greater by that much time. So you can say it is 1 million billionth of the atmospheric pressure on earth. That much pressure difference is there in the atmosphere. There are a lot of particles that are coming from space. Both sun is one of the most active source of so many radiation and particles that are coming. We have plasmas, micrometriots, space debris. All these are going to contribute to some issues in the spacecraft. This try to cover what all problems that occur due to what all 
particles that are present in the space. For example, plasma can lead to electrification. There are arcs that are produced in the structure of the satellite because of the plasma. And this can affect a lot of electronic systems. It can affect the power systems because it will hit the solar panel also. A lot of times, a lot of structural damage can also happen because of the plasma. Radiation particles, they are, there are some high energy particles, there are again galactic cosmic rays, and these can ionize some of the equipments that are there and it leads to, once, once you have ionization, it can, it, this affects both the optical and the electrical part. Particles, they tend to, when they are hitting the electronic circuits, for example, they change the state of the circuit. So if there is, let us say, a zero that is being output by an electronic circuit, it can change to one. Sometimes this, this can be corrected, other times it is not even, we are not even able to collect it, uh, correct it properly. There are ultraviolet, of course, if a meteoroid or a small particle of debris hits the structure, then it can create a small dent into the structure. So all these are so many problems that can arise in a satellite. Same, same slide shown in a different, slightly different way. What all are the problems that are occurring if there is a CCD based camera in the satellite, it leads to noise in the signal of those satellites. Solar cell is continuously getting degraded, so the output power is reducing. Any single particle penetrating into the electronic circuit can change the state of that circuit. So a lot of electronic discharge, uh, discharging is there, electronic particles are getting de degraded, surface is getting degraded, all these are happening because of the environment, space environment and the dynamically changing environment. And we have to test each and every satellite so that every of these things are accounted for. So when you look at the temperature that is there in the space, we have direct impact of the solar flux, that is the sun rays that are coming, we have approximately 1375 watts per meter square, that is the direct solar flux that is coming. Apart from this direct flux, we also have the heat that is radiated by Earth and its atmosphere, especially in the lower Earth orbit, a lot of heat is radiated back and this leads, this adds to the heat energy that is being hit to the satellite. Similarly, Earth is also emitting some of the radiation on its own because of whatever it absorbs the solar radiation, it emits back. And this also leads to change in temperature of the spacecraft. So spacecraft thermal control design becomes one of the most important aspect of designing any satellite subsystem. If there is thermal control is not proper, that, that can lead to a complete failure of a satellite. We have both passive and active thermal control. Whenever you have looked at any satellite, for example, you will see the satellite is golden in color. It appears golden. And that gold color is due to an insulator, thermal insulator that we are wrapping around the entire satellite. This is called as multi-layer insulator or thermal blanket. Apart from that, we have a lot of coatings that we are doing on the satellite structure so that the heat is not getting absorbed, but it gets back reflected into space. Similarly, we have active thermal control also because there are some, you can say, devices in the satellite which have to be maintained at particular temperature. For example, if you are doing temperature measurement itself, if you are, or if you are, if you are camera is in the IR range where temperature itself is being measured, then you have to ensure that the device which is measuring this temperature is maintained at a particular temperature. If it is not maintained, then its own temperature will add to the reading causing a, you can say, error in the temperature reading. So we have to have both heaters and coolers in such a device and such equipments where we can maintain temperatures within even one degree of what is specified for that equipment. This is the energy balance diagram of the Earth. What we have to see is how much of the uh, radiation is coming from the sun, it gets reflected back. There are some ra radiation which is emitted by the earth itself. The total, if you take the sunlight as 100 as a reference and you try to calculate how much of its back, back is reflected, we, have, we can come up with a figure. And this is used to generate how much of thermal control that you are going to need on your satellite. This is something you have to remember. Uh, one of the questions that you can ask yourself is, suppose Earth is a perfect black body, what will be its temperature? Right now, without uh, Earth, Earth being what it is, composed mostly of rocks and metals, 
it has an average temperature which is somewhere around 20 15 to 20 degrees centigrade suppose earth becomes a complete perfect black body and it starts absorbing what will be the change in the ambient temperature of the earth just think over it every parameter that is there of interest to our satellite it varies with altitude so temperature is varying with altitude density pressure everything is varying with altitude if you look at the left hand side image this is a particle image what are the particle counts that is there with the height and you can see that hydrogen and helium and oxygen these three are the highest composition of particle that are available even after you go much beyond the lower earth orbit even after thousand kilometers you have gone these particles are going to remain the other particle they keep going down but at atomic oxygen is a problem also because oxygen is presence in the uh, oxygen's presence in the even higher altitudes you have to ensure that oxidation is avoided so we have to do some coating to avoid the oxidation you have to select the material of the spacecraft to ensure that oxidation do not happen so oxidation is something that has to be taken care of irrespective of the fact that we are in vacuum but still the density the particle per cubic centimeter if you talk of oxygen it is high enough to cause oxidation so this is something you have to remember similarly if you check on the net you can get the curves for all types of particles you can get the debris information you can get the plasma how much of plasma particles are available how much alpha particles are available all these graphs are available and they are quite well known this atmosphere in fact uh, we ha have sent many satellites just to detect this particle densities particle densities the radiation environment and temperature for all these things there were specialized satellites that were sent so that we have the very good information about these particles and accordingly we can design the satellite to withstand those things when you are into vacuum there are certain problems that are going to occur principally because of the vacuum itself one of the most prolific thing is the outgassing outgassing is something if uh, you must have anybody who has driven or entered into a car which is kept in a heat for example and especially in the new cars the moment you enter you start smelling a particular smell that is there inside this is the outgassing that is happening from the new plastic material that is there inside the car that that gases are getting released from that material when you are subjecting it to heat similar thing happens in vacuum that if you have certain material this material are going to lose their mass slightly so out what is called as outgassing gases come out of this material and this is one of the important factors that you have to consider when you are selecting any material to be used in space so th there are some parameters called like total mass loss how much of mass is lost because of the outgassing or how much of material gets collected on the other parts of the spacecraft because of outgassing from this and there is a rule of thumb you can say that the total mass loss has to be less than one percent or the condensable material whatever gets collected that has to be less than 0.1 percent similarly another problem with vacuum is as long as you air for uh, on earth if you keep to metal there will always be a sort of an oxide layer in the metal and it, that prevents the two metal from diffusing into each other and getting merging as a one solid piece but in vacuum this is what happens if you have two extremely clean metal surfaces and if they come in contact in hard vacuum the molecules at the surface of this metal they tend to enter into the other material and this causes them to become like a single solid phase, uh, piece of metal this is called as cold welding and you have to be very careful about this because there will be a lot of gears hinges relays that are going to be there a lot of open close mechanisms are there in space and if this type of mechanism, a relay, for example, which is a contact, no contact kind of uh, device, if that gets affected by cold welding, it may get stuck in one position. It will not move and you will not be able to change the state. So cold welding have to uh, cease to be avoided. One of the way it is done is they keep a small separation between the two metals or you iron, uh, anodize those metal surfaces so that they may not diffuse into each other. The third issue due to vacuum is of course heat transfer because air is not there convection which is one of the most common form of heat transfer on earth whenever we feel hot 
in earth we tend to turn on the fan we turn on the ac so it is the air which is blowing away the heat and in absence of any such heat we do not have that mode of tra heat transfer at all so the heat transfer has to be done artificially and we do it both through conduction where we are using special heat carrying tubes to carry the heat away from the hot surface towards the colder area this is that was the thermal environment and the vacuum now we have the radiation environment the sun as i told it's one of the most active source of all this uh, uh, whatever particles are hitting the surface of the spacecraft electrons protons ions and photons all part types of particles are emitted from the sun they change over a period also it is not that they are it is same and whatever the sun it goes through a solar cycle and that cycle will emit more electron less electron depending on which phase of the cycle you are in so not only do you have to take into account the peak particle density but you all also have to design for the lifetime of the satellite how much of radiation it is going to face during its entire lifetime apart from the sun we have number of protons and alpha particles which are coming from the what we call as galactic cosmic ray their their source is in the, our galactic center it's about the entire composition of our whatever galaxies so from there also a lot of particles are coming and they will also be hitting the surface of the spacecraft and then we have these two belts what what are the van allen radiation belt which was discovered by the very first satellite that was sent by us which ended up discovering this we have roughly two belts one from the 1000 6000 km range and another the 15000 to 25000 km range so any satellite that is operating in this region that is going to face a higher dose of radiation not only that but this van allen radiation belt it it, it is not a spherically same distance from earth it comes closer over the south american region the southeast of brazil the south america region and whenever satellite passes over that region it experiences a higher dose of radiation and you have to also take into account so if you are designing a satellite orbit which is passing through this south at what is called as south atlantic anomaly the total radiation dose that it will face will be higher than those for the other orbit so this is something that has to be taken into account when you are designing a satellite this is again it's the same what was already presented in a text form it is shown here galactic cosmic rays the solar flares and you can see the in the rightmost figure the earth surface and how the van allen belt is the, the, the it is coming closest to what ssa sa is the south atlantic anomaly so there that belt high energy neutron particles they are coming very close to the surface of earth and so whenever a satellite is going to pass over this region this is the region which is shown the south american region approximately 050 degree altitude region and there the the radiation is highest the radiation is measured in what is called as rad that is the unit which is equal to 0.01 joules per kilogram and whenever we are talking of a satellite we design a satellite for a typical radiation dose how much of radiation it will be there per year of the orbit or per lifetime it can experience this all keeps on adding up and that that is the figure which we roughly have the of the dose rate what is shown in the bracket is the impact that is we define the metal that is going to be impacted by the radiation and mostly we are concerned with the electronic subsystems so that is why silicon is one of the most specified radiation dose that is 0.1 kilorad of silicon per year this is there for geo orbit and approximately 10 kilorad because the geostationary satellites they pass through the van allen radiation belt also and so they experience a higher amount of radiation during their entire lifetime what the radiation this they affect the electronic circuit in two different ways if you talk of long term degradation as a satellite is continuing its orbit slowly the ionization that is happening can lead to drift in some of the specifications of the device itself so the current may leakage current may increase the noise may start getting more and more noise will get affected and so over a period of time as the years pass this noise will be continuously getting increased and uh, there will be a performance degradation of the devices there are also localized phenomena where a single high energy particle 
can penetrate deep into the electronic circuit and that can lead to number of changes sometimes these changes are not permanent and they can it is reversible maybe simply by maybe nowadays you can maybe you can shut down and restart the system and that will take care or we even have some mechanisms in the software itself where we try to see that a single event does not lead to a failure in the output of the device itself sometimes this will change the state sometimes it may happen that the, the the device will get stuck in either one or zero that is the latch up event and in a in its severest of case this particle can penetrate right through the device completely puncturing its structure and such a kind of high current if it passes through the device it can lead to the device getting burnt out that local region where that particle entered it will get burnt and such errors are not recoverable so these are some of the things that happen due to the radiation and also you have to test for all these things whatever we discuss right now we discuss the mechanical vibrations and shock we discuss thermal vacuum and the radiation effect so all this testing extensive testing is done for each of the factors that were encountered we know what is likely the vibration is going to be how much of shock these are initially we measure the separation shocks can be measured the temperature we have a very rough idea about how much temperature the satellite is going to face so each of this has in the extensive testing both at subsystem level system level and finally integrated when the satellite complete satellite is ready all these tests are repeated and we have to ensure that the satellite survives all these tests so this is the way vibration test is done this is a james webb telescope what is shown it is being slowly lowered it is inside a tent that is it is placed inside a tent and then it will be placed onto a platform it's a huge platform the satellite this satellite is very big but traditionally we have very big platforms where we can keep payload in tons 4 ton 6 ton right up to more than 10 tons the entire structure can be kept and once you have kept the satellite onto the platform the platform can be shaken so vibrations are introduced and vibration can be introduced in all or any of the axis that is x y z any direction you want you can even give type of vibration also you can decide whether you want sinusoidal vibration whether you want random vibration so whatever vibration you want you can be it can be tested and you can see how the spacecraft structure behaves when it is vibrated so you have to check out whether at a particular vibration it the, there is a re resonance is happening that is something you have to find out whether any structural damage is happening because of the vibration that you have to check this resonance is very important as all of you must be aware of this in our school days when we are doing physics we are told that if soldiers are marching on a bridge they are told to break formation because if it the marching their feet movement the it, it the resonate resonates with the bridge natural frequency the bridge can fall so you can imagine the effect of resonance and this we have to take particular care about in satellite design also so this is a nasa johnson space center image where the james webb telescope underwent vibration tests then acoustic test this is a, this as we told that during the launch you are going to hear huge amount of sound and that that structural damage can happen because of the sound also something which most of you may be familiar with is sound breaking glass so similarly it can lead to damage in metallic structure also because the these sounds are extremely high so what is shown here is an acoustic chamber in the godard space center huge chamber is there and the speaker that is gen generating this noise is it's a 6 foot speaker that speaker itself has a diameter of 6 feet so you can imagine what huge speaker will be it's a 42 foot tall chambers are there and uh, the sound is created the vibrations sound vibrations are created by gaseous nitrogen and it can reach as high as 150 decibels right? and then for a few minutes and then what happened to the structure of the satellite is studied so this is another very important test and what may be the most important test is the spacecraft environment simulator or space environment simulator or the vacuum chamber here the entire air inside the chamber is pumped out we have vacuum pumps there are cryo pumps number of pumps are there inside the chamber huge chambers are there this particular chamber is 40 feet by 27 the diameter is 27 feet and the lengthwise it is a 45th cylindrical chamber and this was used for testing again the james webb telescope at the godard space center 
so here again that uh, the air that is removed one billionth of the pressure density only remains such, such a high vacuum is created and inside that even the spacecrafts are the subsystems are turned on and tested so you can imagine what a huge test this must be the james webb telescope underwent this test for more than approximately 100 days it took to do this test and it, in the range of temperature it went from plus 150 degree to minus 190 degree so you can imagine because the james webb is going to operate at extremely low temperature so that much low temperature has to be created and this is one of this is probably the most important test that a spacecraft undergoes this is the same chamber shown in the other direction the james webb telescope was entire structure was put inside the chamber and the chamber was closed for testing this is a centrifuge test this will give the g force that is required when a satellite is being lifted up it is going to face a downward pressure because of the uplift of the launch vehicle that launch vehicle acceleration is extremely high and that is why the downward acceleration which is which the spacecraft is going to face can be very high. So again, this is a Godard space station image where the spacecraft or whatever the test subsystem is there, it can be accelerated right up to 30 times the G force of Earth and 2.5 ton of a payload, such a huge payload. It is kept in the arm at the one end and slowly it will start revolving. The revolution per minutes are increased so that it can reach a peak acceleration of 30 G. And once this test uh, done, then again, we can see whether any damage is happening to the test. Of course, 30G is never used for human testing. It is very low when human beings are involved. Then we have to test the how much of radiation is emitted by the satellite itself. The payload is producing a lot of radiated fields are there. There are electrostatic discharge that is happening. It is also conducting some of these EM waves. So we have to see up to what level these are reaching because the radiation from one subsystem or of a spacecraft can change the effect the other subsystem so you have to ensure that that the amplitude of this are kept within a particular range that so that the other spacecraft is not other spacecraft subsystem is not getting affected so we have this kind of chamber closed chamber where electromagnetic fields are produced and it is tested uh, the system system is also tested how the system is there how much of how much it is radiating out so there's radiation measurements are there one of the way radiation is tested is also in the particle particle accelerator like we have to generate whatever particle like the solar wind is there or the galactic cosmic rays are there that particles have to be generated and the test test subsystem is bombarded with those particles so both the photons alpha particles gamma rays all this will be created in a particle accelerator and then these particles will be sent to hit the spacecraft subsystems and we can see how much damage it is doing so this is this is one of the testing that is done all these tests whenever a spacecraft is has to be tested it is done in what is called as clean room complete contamination control because dust particles if they are available microbes are available they can impact the performance of a system especially optical system when you have an optical camera is there if uh, dust particles are there where you are testing these particles can go and get adhered to the lens itself and if that that they can create spots so if a dust particle is present there it, it will not get removed later and that particle can generate noise in the image so entire testing of a satellite especially towards the final stages it is done in a complete clean environment all the air is filtered continuous filtration of air is taking place this clean environment may be of different what is called as we call it as class of the room so how many particles are present in one cubic feet or one cubic meter that will decide the clean room number and the very critical subsystem they are tested in extremely high clean room they will be small compact clean room or maybe within a large uh, clean room a section will be created enclosed section having a particle density which is much less so those are extremely uh, clean environment where optics and other sub uh, such subsystems can be tested so there are a lot of filters that air filtering is happening so that bacteria and all these dust particles even small specks they are get they are removed from the room and 
the entire test can happen in an extremely clean environment. This is a, one of an important curve where we define how uh, during a life cycle, what is the possibility of a failure of a, sub, a subsystem? It is called as the bathtub curve. Most of the failure happen during the initial few days or few hours of the subsystem. Then there is a useful life, a long useful life is there. And once again, once that period is over, the, the failure rate increases. And this burning period is typically we know how much of uh, failures can happen during that burning period. And that is why most of the subsystems, they undergo what is called as burning test. Maybe we'll keep the subsystem continuously on for seven days or more. 168 hour is a, one of the most frequently done burning test where a subsystem is kept on for 168 hours continuously and periodically readings are taken to see how the subsystem is behaving, whether there is any change in its functional properties or not. We'll try to see what all are the tests, whatever we have listed out all these tests now, we just showed some of this. This is some of the typical tests that is done by any space system. This is These are the numbers that are taken from one of the document of ISRO itself. ISRO, uh, as, it, as it aware, we are able to give subsystems to be developed outside now. So whenever we are contacting, let's say, a vendor to develop a subsystem, we come up with what is called as a request for proposal. RFP document is there, where we are sending this document to an outside vendor with all our specification. And the vendor has to design the subsystem or, or get us the components based on this specification. And so in one of uh, the document, which we, have, we are getting fabricated from outside, this was the test sequence that is given. This visual inspection is very common whenever you are receiving any, let us say, device or any chassis, any cabinet, you can visually see whether there is any problem or not. You can do it with your eyes or you can do it under a magnification lens. You can see it at 10x. Physical inspection is, of course, the dimension. So anything that is you are indenting that has come after fabrication, you have to do the dimensional test. Then we have what is called as the initial bench test. It is a functional testing that is done at different levels. That is, you can you suppose that there is an electronic subsystem which is nominally operating at, let's say, 3 volt but it can operate from 1 volt to 5 volt. Then what we do is you will test it at 3 volt, you will test it at 1 volt, and you will test it at 5 volt also. So the minimum, maximum, and the nominal operating specification, whether it is temperature, whether it is voltage, whether it is current, that you do, and you generate a set of readings of that subsystem, which, is act, which will act as a reference. So whenever the subsystem is now undergoing different tests, different changes, and its results are available, you will always cross check that those results with the initial bench test. So the initial bench test marks the reference output of any subsystems. The burning test I already described where you have a 168 hour nominally, sometimes it is 240 hours and at different at the maximum condition operating temperature, the system is continuously on and data is logged every Depending, it's frequently it is logged. Definitely once a day, more than once a day, you are taking data, and entire set of readings will be available. Similarly, most of these devices that you are getting, they have to be stored for a longer duration. So temperature storage, both hot and cold, where the maximum and minimum temperature, the device will be kept for let's say 24 hours, and again the specification is verified. Similar for humidity is there, and similarly for operation temperature is also there. The unit is kept on and operated at both high and low temperatures for number of hours and the reading is taken. EMI EMC test, of course, every each of these tests have some standards associated with them. They will be either the MIL standard, the space standard, or some of ISRO has its own standards. ISRO standards are there. NASA has number of standards which are there. Then we have IEEE standards. So all there are number of standards available and all these systems are tested as per those standards. As I told, is vibration test. We do vibration. We have to search first for the resonance of the subsystem. So that resonance, we have to ensure that it is very low resonant frequency is there. And if we have to also ensure that the natural frequency of the subsystem and the natural frequency of the launch vehicle, they do not match. Because if they are going to match, then a higher resonance will take place. So vibration is done in sine wave, vibration is given. Then we have random vibration given. Whenever we are doing a vibration test, the 
final flight model which is going to be launched into space that may not undergo full range of test the range will be less compared to what you are doing in the test development models i will come uh, in a later side i will tell you what are these models so there will be some initially when you are doing a development you may be designing a subsystem that subsystem can undergo extreme tests of vibrations but once the test is validated you design another very same subsystem and for that you can reduce the range that is there for the subsystems this is a typical thermovac that is there uh, when we talk of sac optical payloads for example so it's a cycle which goes on for a few hours to few days and the flat line is where the temperature and the vacuum is maintained and you take readings also so all the square whatever the small squares you are seeing they they are the location or the time where you take the readings for a typical optical payload this can be few days of uh, readings but when you talk of something like james webb you see for how long this test went james webb test underwent for 100 days where different subsystems were exposed to different temperatures and the complete vacuum was maintained and the payload was held at a very high vacuum and extremely low temperature for so many days it took more than one week to achieve the vacuum itself and then to bring the telescope down to the operating temperature it took nearly 30 days just to achieve the temperature it had taken 30 days so you can imagine and for an entire few days after that more almost 30 days again it remained stable at that temperature and lot of readings were taken and finally the temperature was brought back to the nominal ambient condition in fact uh, when this james webb was being tested in the thermovac a huge cyclone had hit the the city where this was being done and it was it was a very critical moment where they were unable to know if the cyclone lasts for a longer time this entire test would have gone bad because of the people were not even able to go to the test site so such a huge problem was there but somehow that entire thing was managed and the james webb came out quite successful in the thermovac test shock test again this uh, this may be done like a drop test you are doing you will drop the satellite from a particular height and ensure what shock it is experiencing so this is that this is that to test the separation thing so we go what the, the, these tables are all there how, how the shock response spectrum is generated how much is the what is the decay rate all those things we are testing in the spacecraft level so then again esd test is there the discharge whatever is going to happen from the satellite that is tested radiated field how as i told this the subsystem is going to radiate and we have to keep this radiation below a certain level so that it does not affect the other subsystems so that that is one of the specification that we are giving that how much of radiated field the discharge is going to happen per second or during a longer duration total how much of field will be generated both the radiated and the discharge test both the tests we are doing right up to the sub few kilowatts uh, kilo volts level of discharge that can happen so whenever a discharge is going to happen the current will flow through the structure so you have to see whether there is any structural damage many devices undergo this life test where an entire life operating life of that component or device is there that has to be tested whether it is able to give similar performance so for a which we, we can accelerate this life test also by using higher than the specified operating temperature so temperature or other specifications so if you operate at high temperature high voltage the life is going to reduce but, but from that you can get an idea about how it will function during its entire life so it, like say if there is a 2000 hours of life test nominally it is done at around 65 degree centigrade and the entire electrical performance parameter like power gain etc is monitored during this 2000 hours once this happens this device then they they can be similar devices they which have come from the same batch they can be used with lot of confidence after all these testings are over we undergo what is called as the final bench test or the final functional test whatever results were obtained during the initial bench test now these have to be verified again after the spacecraft has undergone all the vibration thermovac temperature cycling emi emc everything shock test everything is over you do a final turn on test where you are 
verifying all the parameters and ensuring that they match with the initial test result. Once it is done, all there is a final inspection, visual again is done before the satellite can be integrated with the launch vehicle. There are number of guidelines that are there. These with a lot of experience now, we have come up with numerous guidelines for choose what type of materials have to be chosen, what type of uh, alloys we have to choose, which material will last for a longer time. Everything, all these are there. Apart from that, we have we know the specifications of the each of these components. So you have to ensure that they do, are not operated at the higher end. So they, what is called as degradation or derating that is done. So whenever you are using a component, if that component is going to operate, let's say at 50 degrees centigrade, then the maximum allowed will be somewhere around 40. So if that 10, 10 degrees centigrade is a margin that you are having. So these kind of margins are always built in. Whenever you are using material, we also do what is called as bake out so that the material before it is finally used in the subsystem, it is subjected to vacuum and so that the outgassing will happen and all the outgassing once it is over, the material is properly baked so it can be used. So these are some of the things, guidelines that are there for the vacuum. Similarly, for environmental, as I told, atomic oxygen is one of the problem. So you have to ensure that the material is not, not easily susceptible to oxidation. This glow, again, the bright glow should not be there. That is mostly for optical instrument because if any of the subsystem itself starts glowing, that light will penetrate the optical camera that is taking. Configuration aerodynamic drag, how the launch vehicle profile is designed. That is also something that is considered. A lot of coatings are there. Operations, these are some of the guidelines that we are doing. Plasma guideline, again, as I told, this is for the, whenever plasma is getting and hitting the surface, it can, create certain electro electrical it conducts the charges onto the spacecraft and so you have to see whether it is a external surface is uniformly conductive so that hot spots are not generated we use plasma contactor or plasma thrusters to balance out the whatever unbalanced currents are flowing radiation there are as i told we this is both we do two way that hardware itself you can select in such a way that they are what are called as radiation hardened devices. The, they, they have a specific coating on top of them, which makes them less susceptible to the radiation environment. And at the recovery, the, the algorithm software level also, what we are doing is we design the software in such a way that if one of the latch, whatever latch is there is failing, we have sort, sort of a majority encoder. So we are taking the same input from different latches so that the system automatically recovers even if one part of it fails. Apart from doing all this uh, type of uh, guideline, what we have is we also duplicate the very critical subsystems. Like we are duplicating power subsystems because a power failure can lead to complete failure of a satellite. So we will have two backup power will always be there. We can do it even at the subsystem level. So, for example, suppose you are designing a camera, the camera pixels and will be there. So, number of pixels are there. So, each pixel will not go through the same chain of electronics. Maybe we can do odd even separation so that the odd pixels are processed using one chain of electronics, the even pixels are processed using another chain. So, because you have two such chains, what is happening? Even if one chain fails, the entire camera is not failing. Similarly, when we are talking about uh, transponders in a TV, for example, TV channels. So suppose one transponder, one entire satellite is going to provide, let's say, 1000 channels. We'll keep few spare channels. So there will be maybe 24, 30 channels will be extra. So that if one of the transponder fails or if few channels in a transponder fails, the backup channels are available to take over. So redundancy is one of the most important aspect of spacecraft design where any critical subsystem is always available in redundancy so that the failure of one subsystem does not fail the entire satellite. Apart from this, there are a lot of common sense guidelines that are there that each one of you can do on your own. Even without telling, you should know this, that whenever you are designing a subsystem, the initial planning becomes extremely important. Because if you have started something wrong and you catch the mistake at a later stage during the development, it leads to huge loss of time and finance both. And sometimes the whatever error has happened the initially is so huge that you have to redesign the entire subsystems. This can happen, let's say dimension, for example, if two sp spacecraft subsystems are going to mate 
and that mating interface itself you have not taken care of properly it becomes a huge problem designs are always done step by step and you have to ensure backups are there this is something which you have to remember irrespective of whether it is it is a spacecraft subsystem or a ground subsystem whenever you are doing a subsystem and then you are going to add some features what happens is the addition of feature can affect the subsystem and it may, you may not understand why it is not not working so whenever after adding something you are you are coming in a situation where your subsystem is not functionally working you have to go back to the previous step so backup is extremely important if you have not backed up the working model of that particular subsystem then it becomes extremely difficult to troubleshoot so if something you have added doesn't work you have, you should be able to come back to the previous system and ensure that the subsystem starts working and you take up from that point again and again you do the incremental design one step at a time and see what went wrong redundancies we have already covered margin and derating design lifetime whenever you are making a design you ensure that you are taking the full lifetime environment of the subsystem into consideration don't design for subsystem which can work for few days itself you have to consider the complete 7 year 10 year kind of uh, life then another this is very common now don't leave or create any debris in the orbit uh, for lower earth orbit especially this is something which has become a kind of law now that whenever you are launching a satellite in the lower earth orbit you ensure that once the launch is over once the satellite life is over you are able to remove those debris designs you try to keep the designs as simple as possible again this is a very common sense but this is something you have to remember continuously when you are doing incremental design especially the design keep on adding up and the final end design may become extremely complicated so somehow try to ensure that that doesn't happen and design remains very simple this ask the expert i have added because many times this happens whenever you are designing a subsystem there is it's always possible that there is there are some people who are expert in that like suppose you are doing doing a software you want to use particular function so there there may be someone who is an expert in that kind of software or that kind of function so you can always go up and ask him always be in this habit you have to admit if, if you are having any difficulties admit that you are having difficulty and you ask your assistance from someone it is only then you can come up with the very good design ask better always admit if you are in difficulties if you are having any problems you admit it and you go to someone who knows who has already done similar systems Who has, who has lot of experience so if you talk with him you will be able to solve of course there are a lot of such guidelines anybody who is interested we these documents are available on design guidelines nasa especially has published what are called as the 100 rules for project manager so if you go through those rules those are these kind of rules you can always come across numerous extremely simple but extremely useful rules that have if you follow you can come up with a very good spacecraft subsystem design this is one part of the development which ensures that a satellite subsystem that you are designing operates perfectly in the space environment now other ways how that project is managed itself because tests are one way but a spacecraft is always there are so many subsystems involved it's a huge system so the ensuring proper functioning of a satellite not only depends upon the various tests and the functional that you are designing but it also depends upon the way a project is managed so there is something called as a project life cycle management and number of uh, they, each of these space spacecraft uh, organization whether it is isro nasa isa they have a standard set of guidelines that they follow from the very conceptualization of a satellite to the decommissioning of the satellite when the life is over and each of this phase there will be some reviews that will be held to see whether that particular phase has uh, happened properly or not and if there is anything that is missing then you go back and do the design redesign it again so this is done so when you talk of this is one of the most frequently used number of stages that are there in the development of a subsystem what is called as pre phase or the concept study whenever you want to design a satellite the first thing is the concept why do you want to design a satellite how and how we are going to do it so you come up with number of ways in which the same thing can be achieved so this is ideation phase brainstorming phase where the entire project team the people who will be involved they will get together sit at a table and come up with number of ideas number of ways in which to carry out a task 
at the end of this this may last few months and the end of that you come up with a document which is called as the baseline mission document or the mission concept document and the entire document has to be presented to a specially formed committee which will review, review each and every step that you have undergone and they can come up with suggestions many times many mistakes can be found during the presentation and you have to during the next phase you have to ensure that whatever the shortcomings or problems were identified in the mission concept review that are addressed in the next phase so next phase once the concept is ready not only the one idea is selected but you may even pick up more than one idea to realize the subsystem so subsystem concept and technology demonstration that has to be done so here there are there will be number of technologies there will be tolerance so you have to ensure you pick up the right thing to go into the spacecraft for example you may have a very good subsystem design which leads to the best possible performance but if you are asking for tolerance whether it is a fabrication tolerance whether it's a temperature tolerance which is extremely strict then that fabrication itself may not be possible and so if you are not able to fabricate the item that is required for your design even if the design is best the design is not possible to be realized so these are some of the trade offs that you have to do so the entire system is defined at this phase and the technological aspects the mission requirement the system requirement the entire all architecture is studied and a final system level block diagram you can say is generated at the end of this phase and you hold what is called as the system design review or the system definition review once the system is properly defined there will be again suggestions that will be given during the uh, sdr and those have to be implemented during the preliminary design preliminary of course as the name suggests is the preliminary design where that subsystem is actually built with all the available components and interface everything has to be done similar to what will be there in the flight maybe you can use whatever material is there some of the uh, components you may not use the exact components but you should come up with a functionally working subsystem and this subsystem can also be subjected to the test that we discussed the vibration test or the thermovac test all these tests may also be carried out so a complete functional system is developed during the preliminary design phase and this entire results of this system has to be presented at the preliminary design review and the, in the preliminary design review you you have a realized subsystem but maybe the committee will suggest a better way to realize it better way to meet the specification maybe some margins if you are not meeting they will say they, they will say that you have to be more derating has to be done at this particular so many suggestions will come up during the preliminary design and that have to be incorporated in the final design so once the preliminary design is over you go ahead with the de design of the final spacecraft level unit so complete all the flight whatever parts are there that are purchased the entire the subsystem is designed in what in its final shape size specification everything is it will be exactly same as that of the flight model so this is the critical design because this is what is going to fly so at this stage you should not have any problems left over of course the spacecraft is again subjected to various tests and the results that are there they should match with the preliminary design there should be, there should not be any major changes any change that has happened from the preliminary to the final design they have to be very properly documented even in most cases if you have to change you have to get permission of a committee also you cannot do it on your own so whatever design was presented during the preliminary you are not supposed to change that design also once the critical design is over then entire assembly of the subsystem will happen with the other wherever it has to assemble so that that once the entire assembly is done once again you are validating the subsystem system together and the entire performance has to be presented in what is called as the pre shipment or the launch readiness review so what this review will do is it will check whether whatever system you have developed is ready to be flown into space so this is the final test that is done and again a, a documentation the listing of any issues that happened during this complete design that are very critical so documentation and tabulation specification documentation everything becomes very critical during this entire phase once the readiness is over then the satellite as of course is launched into space and it will continue to operate various the satellite is always 
being monitored from the ground how it is operating and finally you have to decommission the satellite so once the useful life of the satellite is over you have to stop the operation of the satellite in case of remote sensing you always deorbit it and try to bring it back to the earth atmosphere and burn it out so this entire process has to take place so right from the concept to final decommissioning these are the number of steps david these steps will vary this is one of the very famous diagram the same whatever concept was shown in tabular form this is called as v chart or the v diagram and this is also a way of presenting the same same whatever was described in a tabular form here it is described on the concept of fabrication and fabrication to launch so it follows a v structure design concept design testing validation performance verification integration and finally the launch so this is the way it happens in case the project is very large for example it's a human space program is there then the number of phases may remain same but the number of checkpoints will change for example in the previous table we had only few reviews happening but if the it is a human rated system where as astronauts are going to go then the number of reviews that happen they can even double or they can triple so many reviews are conducted many times these reviews will be conducted within your own department also so this is one of the chart where we have shown the same the phases remain same but the whatever triangle every triangle that is shown here is a checkpoint at each checkpoint the entire system is validated and if anything is found wanting you have to redesign the system so how much of this testing has to be done what is the flow chart to be followed all this is depends upon whether the spacecraft in, is being designed for the first time whether it's a human rated whether it's a satellite it's whether it's a complex so all this will decide how many checkpoints you have to undergo this is the same chart that is shown in a different way where at each phase end you are establishing what is called as baseline baseline is the description baseline means the base where the you are testing the subsystem against what so that is the base where the requirement the designs and it will all be frozen up to that level and a document comes out so once you like we said the baseline design document they will, it will always come out after the system is defined if the system is properly defined you come up with a system specification document or system requirement document or what is the baseline document then as you progress with the system design the preliminary design at each level you are making this requirement whatever the specification is coming out uh, baseline document is prepared and that will always be referred to in the subsequent phases of the system so need specify decompose design integrate verify operate and dispose again these are the same phases which were given in the table but the manner of giving it is different this is a typical life scale of a project if you take a simpler program it can be few months but if you take a complicated program it can go into large number of years so uh, the discovery program the concept was studied for 7 months and uh, right up to launch it took 7 years if you take the mars program the conceptual phase lasted 9 months and uh, the it took 6 years to launch a smaller program maybe concept will take only a few months and within 2 3 years you are able to launch the spacecraft and uh, when you are talking of uh, human type of uh, spacecraft the docking mechanisms international space station those kind of projects even our own gaganyaan the concept phase itself can last years and the concept to launch can go more than 10 15 20 years this this also happens in case you are designing a completely new system which you are designing for the first time like it's a very different kind of telescope different kind of satellite so even those kind of satellite they also undergo this long development phase the concept itself you can keep on coming up with new concept back going back redesigning so that itself lasts years and once the development starts happening it can go into decades of years instead of a single digit year so a lot of things are there that are done this is what i talked about the models whenever you are designing a spacecraft sub system you do not design one sub system or one model what is called as a model because when you with the flight model for a very there are some very simple reason why we do this the flight components are extremely costly so you cannot directly start using those components because what will happen is if we are during the testing you damage that component then that extremely high and uh, 
then you have to go back and do it it, it it all becomes very costly affair you may not even get the components initially getting the component itself may take a long time so what you do is you design the initial subsystem using commercial components that can that are used on ground and they may, they may not even be qualified to operate in space but what you are doing is by developing what is called as this engineering breadboard model you are able to demonstrate the function the functional requirement of the subsystem so once that that is developed you know your design whether it is hardware firmware software whatever is the design that is perfectly working and this design is validated so now now what you can do is you can start using the higher grade components that are actually required into the spacecraft system and you can also do the testing because the initial bread mode model you may not be able to test for the entire range of temperature entire range of vacuum because here you are using commercial what are called as off the shelf components the engineering model is slightly higher version where you may have the same dimension in breadboard model you need not even have the same dimension of the chassis and all because you are only demonstrating function but engineering model the structure has to be maintained very similar to that of the flight model and the the interfaces everything is perfect what will be there in the final model here you can use mill grade components that is one grade lesser than the space grade or you can use commercial whatever is done but the, the structurally it is maintained form fit and functionality will same then comes the what is called as qualification model this qualification model in case you are do, repeating the satellites it is a chain of satellite you are doing you may not even do the qualification model you can uh, directly pro proceed to prototype or flight -like model but if some design is being done for the first time then you have to make a qualification model qualification model the model that you are developing the subsystem that you are developing it is subjected to full testing the vibration levels the temperature levels the vacuum the radiation it will be tested to the entire range from minimum to maximum and sometimes you can even go slightly below the minimum and greater than the maximum so that the qualification is done with some margins also so this is the model and once the entire qualification level is done you can either go for proto model or the direct flight model the flight model will be the one that actually flies whereas the proto flight model will be such that it will be completely similar to the flight model but it may not fly and for some sometimes we also fly the proto model like for example you have sent a flight model and the launch fails so you have lost the satellite so in such case you may require the satellite immediately you cannot wait for a long de lead development so if you have a proto model which is called as the ground spare sometime then that model is flown so this is the way subsystems are developed initially you use cheaper components you can even do it in, in some very cheaper pcbs for example when you are fabricating you need not go to a very high costly thing and you can do even the test things whatever the temperature or not done only the nominal requirement is done and the functionality of the subsystem is first demonstrated only after the functionality is perfectly demonstrated you start using the higher grade costlier components and you go in stages and finally you have to subject at least one of the subsystem to extremely complete high level qualification tests and then you go for the flight model this again this is post conducted i told you in the way these are done also the phases at the end of the each phase this reviews are there the entire work of that phase is covered in the review the baseline design review is done in the concept phase itself where you are discussing various possible combination whether it is possible to realize the payload what will be the cost what will be the schedule so everything is documented the budgeting aspects have to be taken so everything is done in the baseline design review once and once you are have the block diagram ready you have come up with a functional block diagram then you can go for the preliminary design here the entire specification of all the major subsystems are defined the component parts are chosen which part is going into which subsystem will be chosen the interface requirement between two subsystems are ensured the design is examined in a very critical manner so in, to ensure that there will be no relaxation in either the performance also and schedule and budget also so whatever your final block diagram you have to come up it is not just the functioning of the subsystem you have to ensure that it will be realized in time and that the performance will be met at the with the same cost also so there should not be any budget overrun of course this happens many times that you, there will be budget and power overrun but you have to ensure that the that these margins are met very properly once the preliminary design review is over 
you undertake the critical design review where the final subsystem is developed into in the same form fit and function so this is the you can call it it will resemble the flight model and so then this this one that is going to fly also so you hear the entire result the functioning in the exact environment that the spacecraft is going to face during its lifetime has to be presented to the committee one thing you have to remember is it, during each of these reviews lot of suggestions will come up so during the baseline there will be many suggestions so the point to remember is whatever suggestions whatever suggestions have been given whatever you can say shortcomings have been discovered that are very properly documented during that review and that has to be addressed in the next review there will be a number tag will be there so to keep track of whatever suggestions have been given or whatever shortcomings were developed whatever specification were not met or if some changes were done from the previous review to this so each of this has to be given a particular number tag and the closure has to happen during the next review so you have to come up with that number this number this was the suggestion this was the shortcoming and we have done this amount of work to overcome that so this has to be very properly documented and brought out in, during the next review the pre shipment review is as the pre it's like the pre launch review where all the test results are conducted and presented any failure if something is not the specification or may not met or something like that is there a very critical review is done to ensure that the subsystem is ready to fly into space so it is only after the pre shipment review committee clears that the payload or the subsystem or the system can be integrated into the satellite all that is whenever a committee is formed what is ensured is that this committee tries to find out all the faults so this is one of the statement beat us now so that you can pat us our back after the launch so any problem you, you have to have this attitude that when you call a committee to review your design you tell them that you have to ensure that you find some faults you have been brought here to do that job and if you are able to beat us if you are able to find out the shortcomings in our design now only then can you congratulate us after the launch because if you are not find that fault there is a possibility that this same fault will come after the launch has happened and then it becomes a huge problem so if any person in the subsystem is not behaving properly he is trying to find many faults with you that is something you should encourage so the more you have what is called it's like an enemy type of attitude on this committee that will ensure that a launch happens successfully part procurement is one of the most important aspect of a reliable design and what we do is every space agency they keep a list of parts which they have already approved through either they have flown those into space in the previous mission or they have qualified by subjecting the parts through various test thermovac vibration everything is done so we maintain that part which where the reliability and quality of that part is assured so mostly we will try to take a part for the subsystem from this prepared or preferred part list if it is not there many times you have to do uh, customization of a part many parts are not available as it is so customization has to be done for customization also what we are doing is we have to do what is called as the vendor qualification also there will be very few vendors who will be willing to do a uh, space qualified part because the numbers you can sell is very less you can end up with during the development itself you can end up with failure and you may not be able to design the part itself so very few vendors are willing to take the risk and they are there and they have the resources the whatever test facilities are required that has to be also be available with the vendor and that is one reason why what we do is whenever we are want to procure a custom built part instead of directly ordering the part we invite various vendors uh, whom we know the big vendors we invite them and we give them the specification that this is the part we have to be developed this is called as expression of interest eoi and we try to find out whether any vendor is willing to fabricate that part for us so this is one process that is done and once a few vendor says that they are going to develop that part then the specification the discussions everything start happening and you can finally select a vendor who will realize that part for you we also try to minimize the number of parts so suppose you are using let's say a resistor or a capacitor so what you try to do is you, you try to use the same capacitor or same resistor so that uh, that will lead to more reliability you are able to the procurement will be easier 
you can reduce the cost by doing bulk purchases all these things are done derating is again whenever you are using a part you ensure that you are not operating it towards the maximum end of its uh, specification you have to derate it 10% 15% as much as you are comfortable so that is done on each part all these parts if you have procured earlier you have to store in a controlled environment this parts will come with a storage specification at what temperature they have to be stored so you have to ensure that they are stored in uh, that kind of environment and we have what is called as bonded store for this so bonded store is responsible for maintaining all the components which have been pre procured before the design is taken place so they are storing this in, in a very controlled environment and the project has to approach them with particular details of which part they want how many want they want and then only then the part is given to the project team outgassing we have already covered this so any material that is used we have to ensure that the outgassing is very less both the whatever material is getting condensed or the entire mass so this is the way the parts is gone this is how generally a project or a satellite program is structured at the top we have the program manager below him there will be number of program project managers S system engineer is the integration engineer you can system integration he plays a very important role because all the subsystems were finally going to come to him and he has to integrate and there will be number of subsystems in any payload for example if you take an optical system there will be a camera team will be there control and data handling is there communication between the spacecraft between the various subsystem eps is of course the power so power there will be a separate team for power then attitude determination and control adc so whatever the spacecraft is going how it is the height the direction all those there will be a sub structures we have a separate team thermal design as i told it's one of the most important aspect so each of this this is a representative you may have more sub system you have more more system is there and below the bottom level there are the design engineers so each of this sub system they may have a project manager or a deputy project manager reporting to the project manager and below this project managers you have the design engineer so normally whenever you are designing any project this structured approach is very important so I, as a program manager you will be aware of there will be number of programs within the same satellite also like if you take remote sensing may become a program and within remote sensing you may have cartosat ocean sat resource sat so there are three programs within the main remote sensing program so they may be called as project so this this structure hierarchy is always there and this hierarchy is, is generated so that the the design is carried out very systematically and communication between the various teams happens very seamlessly otherwise if you do not have a project manager then it becomes you the designer may not know whom to ask if he wants any changes in the sub system any issues so this is very critical the project hierarchy is very critical and it is the entire success of a very satellite management is because of this structure and the design reviews that we just told so the reviews combined with the project hierarchy is what leads to a successful project this of course is just a description of the blocks so i don't think i need to go into this what so these are some of the references that i have used what i did not cover in this presentation is of course the functional testing whenever you are testing for example a camera and the camera has to operate in certain way the image is going to come the entire functioning of the sub system has to be done so what is its noise performance how many bits it has to have what what will be its temperature how it is weighing all those thing but the problem is it's a very huge uh, subject in itself so if i have to go into the sub system level functional testing it will take another one hour so especially when you are talking of uh, let's say thermal cameras the ir cameras to test that ir camera itself we have to develop number of sub systems so there there is a team ground uh, checkout team which is developing the sub system to develop the functional testing of the uh, the main system so it's a huge uh, topic in itself in fact many of this uh, topics whether you talk of vibration whether you talk of thermovac in each of those topic if you try to go in depth you can cover a lot of things but i have given you a very broad overview of what all the testing is done and how a spacecraft project is managed 
So this will be useful in case any one of you has ever to design any subsystem or whatever. All these rules, even though they are for space, they, you can always apply the basic principle for design of any subsystem. So some of the references, George Joseph was our space application center director. He's also called as the father of remote sensing. His book, this building earth observation cameras, it's written in a very, very beautiful way. And many of the material that I have used in this uh, presentation, the basic has been taken from one of the chapters in this book where he has described the various tests that a typical optical camera undergoes. NASA, of course, has an entire system engineering handbook. Anybody who's interested in how the entire system is managed, you can download this. It is a free document, a very huge document, which you can download and you can check it out. Of course, the other references are there from where many of the images were taken and some of the slides were. So this is very briefly about the various tests that you have to do and the way you have to manage the project so that a spacecraft works successfully in space. So to ensure performance, these are some of the things you have to do. Some of the things were left over because of lack of time. Maybe you can go into whoever is interested. He may go into in depth using this references. Slide. So thank you to the VIT management, to the Indoscience Education Trust, the entire team, ISA team, which is there for giving me this opportunity to talk with you for such a long time. You have been listening very patiently. I wish you all the best in your engineering, both during the educational phase and also during your further career. Thank you.